You know, I never, never expected to be a photographer. When I was a young man, young kid, the one thing in the world that interested me was the steam locomotive. I, mean, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the locomotive. And I think, you know, uh, I can sense that quite a few people here tonight have also been overwhelmed by the locomotive. But it really was the locomotive that got me started. And this was right after the, or right during the Second World War, and right afterwards, when Dr. Diesel's invention began to intrude on my railroad in Vermont, the Boston and Maine, the center of Vermont, I realized that this was really the end of the steam engine. You know, we we're going to be, see them disappearing very rapidly. And this, I guess, got me going on that path to keep one step ahead of the wrecking ball the rest of my life. But when I was very young, it was the steam locomotive. And you know, I didn't really understand, as we do now, that the steam engine really was the machine that, set, that changed the world. I mean, the wheel, yes. But then until the steam engine came along, we were really dependent on the horse and the ox and think of steam engine on the waters. I think before the steam engine came, it would be very hard to get up the rivers or to cross the ocean. We were dependent on the whims of the wind. And when you think about the fact that we really, in the early part of the 20th, 19th century, I keep calling the last century the, the 19th century, which it isn't anymore, but in the early part of the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, land transport was really disastrous. When you think about, think, take Andrew Jackson, for instance, all right? And then you think, oh, what's the kind of roads that he have? If you think, you go back to Caesar's time, there were better roads than we had in the early 1800s. So comes the steam engine and comes the railroad and comes the huge and enormous change that happened in America and really in many other places in the world. And I guess I don't have to tell you this, but if you look at the road map of America today, it really represents the railroad map many years ago. So let's see if I can get this thing started here. All right. Where am I? There. All right. This is the first photograph I ever took, age 11. This is in Putney, Vermont, and that's train number 74. This, I called it the 420 because it came in at 420. And the first time I went down to the station to take this picture, which I took with my mother's little red box brownie camera, I stood on the platform, and I was very used to looking at trains going by and forth, and I wasn't scared of the engine, but the idea of taking a photograph made me begin to shake. And so I had a case of buck fever, so I handed the camera to my mother and said, here, you take it. So she did. This is not her picture, because a few days later I was braver and stood my ground as the 420 hove into sight. Now, as I was saying before, you know, it was the excitement of trains, engines, when I was a kid that really turned me on. This I did when I was 16 when I had learned to use the darkroom. And I studied with some friends of mine who knew Ansel Adams' zone system, which was a perfect thing to use to photograph dark black steam locomotives in the white winter snows of Vermont. 
This is on the Rutland Railroad, which was a great favorite of mine. The Rutland Railroad was really an anachronism. This was done in 1948. Even then, the railroads had begun to digitalize heavily, but the Rutland remained with steam. And it was really because it was a terribly impecunious outfit. And when they finally decided to buy some new engines, they had to tear up part of the railroad in order to pay for them. But it was great fun for me, because I knew all the train crews that ran from Bellows Falls to Rutland. And I used to ride up on the train, and when I got to Rutland, the engineer, uh, the conductor on the southbound train, named Bill Hogan, would always say to me, quick, get on the other side so the train master won't see you. Bill Cannon, the engineer, is waiting for you. So I'd run up the other side of the train and climb up into the cab, and I used to ride 80, 81, 84, and the old 10-wheelers, which were the most incredible engines that built in 1910, all hand-fired, all their engines were. And I would ride on, behind the fireman, seat, actually in the fireman's seat, because most of the way he was, he was at work. And I was, you know, I was an 11, 12, 13-year-old boy, and this was one of the most exciting and terrifying experiences, as you could well imagine, holding on for dear life as these engines raced up and down what was really more of a dirt road than a railroad track. There wasn't an ounce of ballast anywhere on the Rutland. But when I look back on those days, I think to myself, really, what an experience for a young boy to have had. And the Rutland, of course, exists as a track today, owned by the state of Vermont. Very shortly after I went to Yale, the Rutland dieselized completely. And I decided, you know, I love railroads, but I have to make somehow, I have to turn this into a profession. So I thought perhaps the best thing to do would be to study economics, which I did, which was a terrible mistake because I was an awful student. But in the last year at Yale, in 1955, a member of the Great Northern came to, they all did send representatives to the colleges to recruit, see if they could find anybody who wanted to go to work for the railroad. Well, it turned out that I was the only person that showed up. And it also turned out that despite my terrible marks, I was hired by the Great Northern. And so I accepted the job and went to work as assistant to the train master, which sounds like a very, very important position, which just meant that I was to learn the railroads. I was assigned to Wilmer, Minnesota, and I'd never lived in the Middle West. I'd lived in New York and Vermont, so it was a huge culture shock. But what was wonderful was that the Great, the great Northern's Wilmer Division was the last division that used steam engines extensively. And so I had a lark, because my past said good on locomotives and freight trains. And my boss, the train master, said, I want you to ride trains. I don't want you to sit around the office. I want you to get out there and learn the railroads. Well, they didn't have to twist my arm. So I spent the better part of a year riding trains, riding engines, riding in the cab. And sometimes the firemen would say, why don't you just do this, these are oil burners, oil burners, all right. So I learned how to fire an oil burning engine, which is nothing like firing a coal burning engine. But I rode engines, I rode snow plows, I rode all over the system, and two things happened. I mean, I got I was, uh, the experience of being a railroader, and I also fell in love with the Middle West. I was absolutely smitten with the fact that you could go out to the end of the line, North Dakota, and you could stand there, and there was absolutely nothing to hold you up. You know, in Vermont, you always trees to lean against, right? New York, you always buildings. And for the first time when I got out there, I realized, good heavens, the world is round, because I almost felt dizzy. <laughs> absolutely fascinating experience. Anyway, I, worked, I stayed on the Great Northern until one morning I came back to my office, and I found a note that said I had been promoted. I was on my way to the general office. And I thought, wait a minute, that's not really, what, that's not really the part of railroading I was interested in. 
I loved, I was, it was the romance, it was the locomotives, it was the, you know, the, the fact that these engines and trains went all over the country. You know, just the romance of the railroads. Was, I was smitten, just as I was when I was a little boy. So when I realized that I was going to be promoted away from these engines, I quit. I walked back, went back home, and I really didn't know what to do. So I wanted to be a photographer, I knew that, and I also loved railroads, as you know. Now I'm sure you've all heard of Winston Link, the great photographer of the night on the Norfolk and Western. Well, I knew of Winston Link, and he was in New York, and so was I, so I boldly called him up and said, could I come and see you? Well, it was an auspicious meeting because he needed an assistant. So I was hired by Link in the fall of 1958, and that was the beginning of my professional career. And what a taskmaster he was. And, you know, I'm sure you all know his work, and I'm sure you know that he photographed locomotives at night, which he lit with flash bulbs. Not just one, but hundreds in reflectors <laughs> with yards and yards of wires all over the place. He would go down with a trailer load of Sylvania blue dot flash bulbs, literally, behind his car, a case loads of them. And he would unload this all by the tracks. He'd set up tents for all of his equipment. He'd connect to the dispatcher's line. The railroad knew him. The Norfolk and Western gave him absolute carte blanche. He could do anything he wanted. And so he would, they would set up, he would set up by the tracks and we would get all set. And we went, the one trip I made with him was to photograph a double header that they arranged for him because it was virtually the end of the steam operation. It was in the spring of 1959 and the last Norfolk and Western engines ran, steam engines ran in May of 1969. So this was just before the end. So they set this up for him. And of course, he was, uh, we were there for about a week before the train actually ran. And we had to make a test to make sure that everything worked because he's had three speed graphics set up, all set up so that he could push one red button and the whole night would light up. So we decided that we had to test this first. So we set everything up. I screwed in all the bulbs all around, okay, on a ladder. And unbeknownst to the Norfolk and Western and to us, well, not to the Norfolk and Western, but to us, a, a train was coming down the mountain. And as the train went, there was a curve north where we were. As the train came around the mountain, Link fired the red button into the face of the engineer. So what would you do if you're an engineer? He jumped the air and he broke the train apart in three places, which the Norfolk and Western wasn't too happy about. So we promised that we would never do this again. We would let everybody know, and so they let everybody know that we were there. And the night that the train did, for, they did run for him, we did a couple of things. We said, please tell the engineer and the fireman and the brakeman, whoever is in the cab, not to look back at the camera, to look ahead. And because it was the very end of the Norfolk and Western steam days, their engines were not that well maintained. And we were set up originally to photograph them as they came toward us. And I said to Link, you know, there's gonna be an awful lot of steam leaking out of that engine. And if you fire these flash bulbs in there, all we're going to get is a great cloud of steam. So we turned it around and we shot as the train went, as the engines went by, and it worked. And he took an absolutely magnificent photograph. And he also, as you know, recorded things. And he, the same night, he recorded the picture of this, of this very, very wonderful occasion. Well, anyway, Link had his Norfolk and Weston. And I felt I needed my railroad. And having heard the steam whistle first in Vermont on the Rutland and the central Vermont, I decided I should go back to New England and go back to the north. And I knew that the Canadian Pacific still operated a fairly large 
flotilla in those days, probably not that many, of locomotives on the Atlantic region east of Montreal all the way down to the Bay of Fundy, St. John. So in the early summer of 1959, I wrote a letter to Mr. Wallace, Mr. D.B. Wallace, who was the Director of Public Relations on the Canadian, National, Canadian Pacific. And I was quite bold again. I said, you know, I want to come and I want to document your engines because I know how important the steam locomotive is or was to the development of Canada and the United States. And I said, you have a great stable of locomotives and I would love to come and photograph them. Well, to my great surprise, he sent me back a letter. It was long before email. The letter came almost the next day when the Postal Service was really quite good. And he invited me to come to Montreal. So I went directly to Montreal and I sat down across from him and in his office and I explained again what I wanted to do. And he said, fine, I'll give you the run of the railroad, which he did. He really wrote me a ticket to heaven. I had permission to go anywhere I wanted, ride any engine, go into any yard on the Canadian Pacific from Montreal to St. John. And so, I took off, but then the CPR. And so I went to Montreal, and I went first in the summer, in July and August of 1959, and then I went back again in the winter. And these pictures were taken in Montreal and all up and down the system. All of them 10 below zero, I mean freezing cold, What's better for taking pictures of locomotives than the coal? And there were only a few locomotives, really. And I said there's a flotilla, but there were only, only a few. 5145 was one of the stars, right? And my idea was not to record each engine as an individual, but try to get the sense of the locomotive call it locomotive ness, if you will, it sounds awfully self-conscious, but trying to give a sense of what these wonderful, wonderful machines were really like. This was taken in a place of gigantic Quebec on March the 29th, 1960. This is a local train in waiting in the, in the yard to take a train to Sherbrooke, Quebec. Cold, 10 below probably. Same place from top of the coal dock. This morning, they had three steam locomotives operating for the last time in McGandy. The engine over there in the back is the 5107, which had come in on a little train called the Scoop, which ran from Brownville Junction to McGandy and back every other day. And I rode that engine that morning, over from the day before from Brownville over to McGandy. And I was on that engine on the way back, and there lies a tale. But I went to Montreal, and this was in the great Glen Roundhouse, which was the, the engine terminal that serviced all the passenger engines for the Canadian Pacific leaving Montreal. And when I was there, they had seven engines operating. There were seven commuter trains and they had exactly seven engines at one time in operation. They did have a roundhouse full of engines, some of which were steam, under steam, and some were not. And the idea was, of course, that these engines would be run until they ran out of time, their time, in which case they would be set off to be scrapped, and they'd pull, fire up another one and bring it out. This is the 5107 at Brownville Junction, at, at McGantic, about to take off, back down and, and hitch up to the scoop. Another engine is an old eight wheel, a 280 switcher, which they used in the yard. They used it in that, that yard that day for the last time because the usual engine was a diesel. The diesel had been called out for snowplow duty. Vaudreuil, which is one of the terminals of the commuter service, one of th they had three trains from there, three from Rigal, and one to Farnham. Well, I went out to Vaudreuil, drove out in the morning from Montreal, 
I got out there before the trains left, so I, I had plenty of time to walk around in the freezing cold and capture these engines. And, you know, they really just, I mean, it just, they're just, they were such beautiful creatures, and they really, I call them creatures because, I mean, they breathed. I mean, they had such life to them. Now, this engine is a 2461, which became a friend, and I photographed it until it was taken away to be scrapped. In 2412, again, the next day, it made its last run. But of course, you know, to me, and not just because it was winter, but because I've always found the Roundhouse to be one of the most magic places. There are three places that I can remember. The Roundhouse, the engine room of a, of a steamboat, reciprocating steam, triple expansion engines, and an open hearth furnace, and a blast furnace room in a steel mill. Four places that I have never been anywhere which were more exciting and more wonderful. And the steam engine, when you were there in the roundhouse, was always being tended to. You always got the sense, you know, there, what the word iron horse really meant. And they were always, somebody was always tending them, making sure, of course, that there's plenty of water and water and all of that. And there were two men inside fixing, they were cleaning, what they were doing was welding the bottom of the smokestack, which is called the petticoat pipe, as I'm sure you and the railroads know. And they were welding this on so that the engine could work the next day. And I just thought, you know, I was quite amazed that there were three people working on this, two of them inside. Always somebody working there. Always the Canadian Pacific, like the Great Northern, took beautiful care of their engines. And they always were washing them down. And even though this old air pump looks a bit worse for wear, they always were taking care of all the little parts of the engines. Very labor-intensive machine, the steam engine. And as you who've worked on the railroad know, if you leave a steam engine alone in the roundhouse that's under steam, there's always the chance <laughs> that the steam will get into the cylinders and the engine may move. So they chain it down, they put chains under the wheels. And to me, this, you know, there's the chain on the side. They had freed this engine, and it was just backing out of the roundhouse, but unchained. Now this is on the Canadian National at Hamilton, Ontario, where I went in, in, the, in May of 1959, last place on the Canadian National, east of, Winnipeg, where they were using steam engines, and they had a few, and I was there for a week. Same engine backing out of the roundhouse, and there's the hostler, who was the man, of course, who was responsible for the engines, the iron horse in the roundhouse. And of course, you know the word hostler means one who cares for horses, so it's very apt. Here again, we're in Montreal. The 2822 is one of the, I uh, probably don't have to tell you this, I'm sure you already know, was one of the Royal Hudsons that the Canadian Pacific built. They built 45 of them. And the 2850 hauled Queen, sorry, King George VI and Queen Mary across Canada in 1939. Canadian National went one way, Canadian Pacific the other. And the engine that pulled it had a coronet, a royal crown on the running board of the engine. And all of the engines of that class were then dubbed, christened Royal Hudsons. Because the royal family gave the right for the Canadian Pacific to carry the crown on those locomotives. The only time the royal family ever gave permission for the royal crown to be used on any other machine outside of the UK. I have one. 
because Mr. Wallace gave me one, at the, sent it to me after I, my last visit, after they had scrapped this particular engine. Well, it, as I said, it's a very labor-intensive business taking care of the steam engines. You've got to fill them with water. This was on the Quebec Central, which was a subsidiary of the Canadian Pacific. It's no longer in existence. This was taken to a place called Valley Junction, Quebec, the last day of operation. Well, after the Canadian Pacific, it went down to the Virginia Blue Ridge, which operated three ex-US Army switch engines, which they bought for surplus. And they had three of them, and they, run one, they ran one a day, and I spent a week down there photographing these engines. Again, even on a little tiny railroad, they kept washing the engines down. This is in McAdam, New Brunswick, which when I went there in the summer of 1959 was a good, smoky old railroad town, just filled and crawling with locomotives. And again, the CPR made sure that they were washed before they went out. Now this engine is a very special engine. This is Central Vermont number 707. Now the Central Vermont was a railroad that had very light track, light bridges. And it went over the spine of the Green Mountains in Vermont. And the Central Vermont needed an engine that had long enough wheelbase. They needed a powerful engine, good enough to cope with the grades over the Green Mountains, but they needed a long wheelbase to spread the weight out over the bridges. So they ordered a 2104, a Texas type, one of the earliest ones, 1928. They ordered 10 of them, and they were the pride and joy of the Central Vermont. They were also the largest engine that ever ran in New England. But the Central Vermont was owned by the Canadian National. And when the Canadian National began to dieselize, which it de and it dieselized from east to west, unlike the Canadian Pacific, the Central Vermont got run through diesel engines that came all the way from Sarnia, Ontario, and ran all the way down to New London, Connecticut. And so one by one, these great engines were retired until the 707 was the very last. Now, like all railroad aficionados, all people who are steam engine addicts or whatever you want to call us, we knew where this engine was. And every time I went to our farm in Vermont, I would call the roundhouse foreman in White River Junction and ask him, do the 707 come in today? Is it coming in? And almost every day, almost every time I called, I said, no, sorry, not coming. One day, the end of March, 1957, I called. And he said, yes, it's going to be here in about an hour. Putney was 54 miles from White River Junction. No interstate highways in those days. And I arrived just as it came in. I had an old, that old three and a quarter, four and a quarter crown graphic with one film pack, 12 exposures, and a Leica with one roll of film in it. Every exposure had to count. So I did. I went around and I watched the engine being serviced, everything. And when I was all finished, when the pastor had done all of this, he put the engine on the turntable and he said, don't you want to take its picture, almost take its portrait, before I put it in the roundhouse. So he held it there while I took two of my very valuable 12 exposures, left me with one. This is one of them. Then they put the engine in the roundhouse, and I went in the roundhouse and took another. On the 26th of March, which was not very long after I took this picture, it was called once more to haul a northbound train from White River Junction to St. Albans, and it was retired. And I wrote the Central Vermont, telling them of my experience with the 707, and said, would it be possible to have just a gauge, anything from the, from the 707? And he wrote, the general manager wrote me back and said, I'm terribly sorry, it's already been scrapped. But anyway, Brattleboro, Vermont was very close to where I lived. 
And I, of course, spent as many hours, days as I possibly could, and I knew all the crews. This was a wonderful N5 consolidation with the Central Vermont's sort of workhorse. They had 16 of them. And they used them on the local freights, and they used them on the freights south of Brattleboro because the big 700s couldn't go south. Here is the picture, that one of the pictures I took at White River Junction that day with the Leica. McAdam, New Brunswick, again. Wonderful place where I spent almost a month. And I told the roundhouse foreman, who I met and who took great interest in what I was doing, the man who read, the third trip, second trip, 11 to 3. And I said to him, he said, well, you got everything you want, you're getting everything you want? I said, yes, but you know something? I'm really sorry that I can't develop the film. You know, in all of, everywhere I went, I carried a portable darkroom with me. That Winston Link said was an important thing to do. When I took all those pictures in Montreal, I, had, I rented a room in a motel, a dismal little place down by the roundhouse, and I turned the bathroom into a dark room. And so I'd photograph all day, and I'd come back, and I'd develop film all night to make sure that I had it. But when I went down to New Brunswick, in McAdam, I had all the equipment, but I didn't have any place to put it. So John listened to me, and he, and he took it all in. Well, I came back a day or two later from photographing all day out, and John said he wanted to show me something. I said, what? So he took me down underneath the roundhouse, and there, he had built a dark room for me. He'd had his plumbers and his pipe fitters and his carpenters and everybody, hot and cold water and a sink, a dark room. So there I was with my beloved engines on top, having photographed them all day long so I could spend the night, the evening, in this wonderful little dark room that he built for me, developing the film. This Actually, this engine still exists. This is the 494 on the Gunbar and Rio Grande Weston at Chalmont. And there's sand in the engine. Everybody knows you have to have sand for the traction. Brownville Junction taking coal. That really, the, these engines needed people. And there were many, 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 many people who lived and worked with the steam locomotive. I don't have to tell you this. And when the diesel came, most of these people were unnecessary. But while the engines were, while the steam engines were there, many men spent their lives working on them. Of course, one of the great rituals of the steam locomotive was oiling round, the engineer oiling round the engine before it left the terminal. And whenever there was time on the trip, on the journey, when the fire room was taking water, the engineer would come down from the cab and go around with those wonderful long spouted oil cans, thrusting it here and there, dropping a precious drop of lubricant. Also taking his hand off and feeding the turtles, feeding the brain, feeding whether the engine was getting too hot. And this was done in Montreal. The engineer was oiling again the 2461 before it went down to pick up the train at Windsor Station. These two men I'm very fond of. Both of them are not with us anymore. They were the engineer and fireman on the last regular run of the scoop, the last regular run of a steam-powered, regular scheduled steam-powered standard gauge train in the United States. And I was in the cab. Bud Rolfe is the engineer, and Doug Blue is the fireman. And I, there's a story which I will tell you in the next picture, and in one of the pictures that's coming up. But these were, the Scoot was a really remarkable little train, which I had ridden the summer before, back and forth across Maine in, into Quebec, in a virtually roadless part of Maine. Ah, here's another wonderful fellow. This is Bob Toms, who was the engineer on the scoot in the summer of 1959, which I rode back and forth from Brownville Junction to Magantic countless times. And Bob became a very good friend. 
And Bob's daughter wrote me a letter the other day. She heard about this book, and I, she sent me a letter, an email actually, and said, I would love to talk to you. And I, had, I called her, but she never called me back, but I'm going to keep after her. Doug Blue's daughter, Karen, also called me, and we had a long discussion. And she has a book, and she has pictures of her father. Both these men are gone. Now, you know something about the locomotive, the steam locomotive. You understood how it worked. It was all there in the open for the eye to see. There was nothing hidden. You looked at the wheels. You looked at the mechanism that made it go. And you know, even as a kid, you could understand how it worked. You don't have to be an engineer to understand a bridge, what makes it, what holds it up, to understand a truss or a suspension bridge. You don't have to be a mechanic to look at a picture of a, of a locomotive and understand how it works. This engine is a Reading Company 484, which was used on that wonderful series of excursions. After they had dieselized, they saved three engines to run on what they called Iron Horse Rambles. And Iron Horse Rambles were one of the most successful excursions that, ever, that anybody ever ran, and the railroad made a lot of money on them. And we all knew where they were going to be, and they were trains of 20 and 22 cars at length, and they would stop, you know, for photo runbys, and most of them were double-handed. But the engine, just look at this engine, it's just ready to go. This is the Lake Superior and Ishpeming 280. This is a I'm sure you know this engine. This is the Milwaukee, the former Milwaukee 261, which now lies in pieces on the floor of its home in Minneapolis. It's just been bought, as you probably know, by the Sandbergs who ran this, who bought this, who operated this engine. And they're trying to figure out whether they have the money enough, money enough to put it back together again. It was an absolutely beautiful engine. And I knew some people who knew them very well. And when the engine was operating into Chicago, you know, they hid it off in some obscure corner of the yard so nobody could go and photograph it and, and bother them. But I was invited to have an audience, let's say, with this engine. And I spent the most wonderful day photographing the 261. This is another. I mean, this just speaks to me of motion. This is the Canadian National. There it is, the 6218 on an excursion in July 1965 in White River Junction. There is the Iron Horse, these are again the Iron Horse Rambles. You know, they were, they were not in regular service, but they were locomotives. And they certainly spoke of locomotiveness. This was the first one, the 21 24 and the 2101. Now, the railroad in the landscape. This is on the Great Northern, obviously. And the grain elevator. And the railroad and the grain elevator, to me, is one of the most important parts of railroad history. I mean, this country is just I don't have to tell you about the grain elevator, but to me, coming from New England, I was absolutely smitten with the grain elevator. And of course, it's the icon of the, of, of the prairie, of the plains, of the agricultural heartland. This is on the Union Pacific, the old Kansas Pacific, at Cheyenne, Wells, Colorado, and Sandra and I went there last summer to see this place, and not one thing is left talking about being one step ahead of the wrecking ball. The station's gone. There are a few broken down remains of the elevators. This is on the old IC through, this is in Manson, now the CN, the grain elevators. I'm fascinated with the grain elevators, and, I, and they are such an important part of our landscape. 
that I have spent a great deal of my life photographing the grain elevator and the railroad in relation to the grain elevator. This is in Carter, Montana, a town a population of three. <laughs> I never saw anybody there, and I was there for two days. Fascinating little town. <laughs> and so fascinating with the grain elevator that I did it twice on two different days. There's the Great Northern, and it's on the Great, it was on a branch of the Great Northern that came down from Hera to Great Falls. And the railroad is still there as far as I know, but as far as I know, the grain elevator probably is not. Now this one I just did this summer. That's at Gorham, Kansas, just west of Russell. This is Aurelia, right? Someone recognizes it, I can hear. What's that? The uh, station house is gone. It has. That's sad. This was taken in 1986 when I was doing a book on Iowa. And I spent quite a bit of time there because it was such a fascinating place. I have quite a number of photographs, so I chose this one tonight. I'm sorry to hear that. See, it's true. I mean, you, you, you have to get there quickly. You, know, you go back again, half these things aren't there. Now, this is very much there. This is the Dare. This is Iowa International Interstate over here. And this is a very modern, wonderful grain elevator, West Central. This is a picture that I am very fond of. This is a place called Golden Valley, North Dakota. The railroad's gone, and the grain elevators are toppling over. But I caught the picture, I caught this grain elevator out of the corner of my eye, racing for Williston to spend the night. I was tired. I couldn't pass this up. So I drove down, and I thought I was going to not get there in time, so I took one picture back. It wasn't any good. So then I moved up here, and I looked behind me, and I saw there was a bank of clouds that was just about to come over the sun. So I waited until the clouds in this picture were in the right position, until I was absolutely sure that these grain elevators were lit. And I fired a few frames, probably a roll of film, and by the time I finished, the cloud had come over, and this thing had been completely eradicated. It was actually gray. So you never can pass up. Don't ever pass up anything that you see, because it's a photograph is evidence of a particular moment in time, and a beautiful moment. And I'm glad I have this, because this place doesn't exist anymore. This does. This is Quintar, Kansas, this summer. And it's on this wonderful line of the Union Pacific that just disappears into the plains. Now, there's always the, tra always the tracks leading. This is what's so fascinating about the railroad. Not to be a train. You can imagine trains. You can imagine a train right there. I mean, I was there all, you know, I was there for three or four days in this part of New Mexico. This is a place called Grenville in the Colorado and Southern. Never saw a train. But when I took this picture, I could almost hear the whistle. And you know, how many times did we cross a railroad crossing on the highway? I'd wish there was a train. Just, I do. I never can pass the railroad crossing without slowing down. And Sandra and I go and photograph together, and she says, I always do my best work with the railroad, which I think is true. You know, Minor White, the great photographer that I studied with, between the time it went to Winston Lake and the railroad. I, he was a fine man and I learned a great deal from him. But he said to me one day, he said, you know, I was, I was realizing the engines were going and I, I guess I was very nervous. And he said to me, go do your damned engines, steam engines, and get them out of your system or you'll never do anything again. <laughs> he was right. I had to go do the engines, but I never got them out of my system. And to this day, whenever I see a railroad cross buck or railroad crossing, I slow up, just in case. And sometimes, 
I was lucky. This is on the Northern Pacific. This is a freight train climbing Livingston Hill westbound, a 4664 Challenger on the head end, and a 2884 pushing. You know, I mean, to me, this sort of reminds me of the way the railroads might have looked when they first built them. This is a very unused part of the Milwaukee that stretched out to Rapid City. You know, I know a lot of you from the Milwaukee Society here, and you know, of course, this line doesn't exist anymore. I believe that part of it has been bought by somebody who intends to restore it part of the way, but this line has been ripped up. And I was out there, and I never, 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 ever saw a train on this track. But you can find trains. I could find trains. This is in Montana, on the Northern Pacific. Going, same thing, same train. Out on the open, the train in the landscape is a very important part of my work. Uh, this one. There is a tale about this picture. If you notice, there's an open boxcar door, three cars in on the bike. Well, I drove, I was driving west on Route 20, west of Haver, Montana, on the Great Northern. I always had a sore spot for the Great Northern. And I saw this train, and I saw that boxcar, and something struck me about it. It was something that made me focus on the train, that empty boxcar door. So I had a rattle trap old car, and I drove as fast as possible on the roof US 2 until I caught up to the train. I had a roller flex, jumped over the barbed wire, and waited. And I waited until I saw the boxcar coming, waited, and all of a sudden, the sun burst out of the sky and lit the foreground just as the boxcar door passed by. Serendipity, chance. And I did another book a few years later where the editor said to me, I want you to take that picture again. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I spent a year actually trying to satisfy him. Well, he used this picture in the book. Because you cannot, I mean, a moment like that is unique. And that's one of the wonderful things about photography, that you can catch those moments. But you better catch them, because they're never going to be the same again. And this, this image could never be, and I've seen many trains passing in the distance, but never like this one. Now, one of the things, of course, one of the most important things, one of the great things that the railroads have left in the landscape are its bridges. This is the Lethbridge Viaduct, Lethbridge, Alberta, which is the longest, largest, heaviest steel viaduct in the world. across the Old Man River, just west of Lethbridge on the CPR. This is the Thebes Bridge across the Mississippi River, which was built in 1904 and is still carrying very, very, very heavy freight traffic today. Very typical of a cantilever bridge across the Mississippi. This bridge is an artifact. This is the Young's High Bridge across the Kentucky River at Tyrone, Kentucky. And I'm not hanging from the airplane. There's another bridge right next to it. This bridge was built in 1889, and it has not been changed, not touched, not strengthened at all. Now, it's out of service since 1975, and it was built by a little railroad that had big ambitions, and it built this immense and beautiful steel cantilever bridge across the river. It is probably the best example we have today of an early steel bridge, because it's absolutely the day, exactly the same as the day it was built, except it's rusty. And there are people that are trying to save it. Let's hope they will. <laughs>
This is just, we don't have many concrete bridges. This is one across the Susquehanna River, which is not navigable and very shallow, so you have lots of very long, short span bridges. This is on the Reading Company, built in 1916. Now, this is the quintessential concrete bridge in America and perhaps the world. This is the Tunkhannock Viaduct on the Lackawanna at Nicholson, Pennsylvania. And the Lackawanna decided in 1904 that it was going to build the super railway between New York and Buffalo. It had the disadvantage of starting across the river from New York at Hoboken. So they built a great magnificent fleet of ferries that lasted till 1967, mahogany and glass and magnificently appointed boats to draw passengers across from New York to get on its trains. They built a beautiful terminal in Hoboken. And then in New Jersey and in western and in northeastern Pennsylvania, they decided they were going to build a railroad that paid no attention to the rivers. And so they cut and filled and built four absolutely magnificent concrete viaducts. The, one in, the ones in New Jersey, the one in the Poland's Kill, the one on the New Jersey cutoff, has been abandoned. They're thinking of bringing service back to it. But this one is now owned by the Canadian Pacific. And they still use it, not for many trains, but it's still there. It's absolutely indestructible. And you know, when you f I hate flying, but once in a while I've had to fly. And if you happen to be on the right side of an airplane flying from Chicago to New York, it's one of the few things that you can identify from 35,000 feet. This is the scoot crossing the Ship Pond Stream Viaduct at Onawa, Maine. Now, you remember Doug Blue and Bud Rolf? All right, they're the engineer and fireman. I told them when I took the train going west to Megantic that I always wanted a picture of a train crossing this viaduct. Well, they must have talked about this because when the train got to Onawa, they cut the engine off. I was riding the engine. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, you want that picture, don't you? So they cut off the engine, ran me across the viaduct, and left me off on the other side. And I said, look, you're going to have to you're going to have to catch the engine. You're an old railroader. You know how to do it. So here I was, two feet of snow on the ground, all by myself because they backed the engine off. And I saw it off in the distance, heard them whistle off from Onawa. And I, my trusty old roll effects, I said, OK, where am I going to shoot this engine? I had a fresh roll of film. You never use the first exposure because that's the one that you might crinkle when you try to develop, at least I do. You put it into the, into the reel, right? Second one, that's too close to the end. I'm not going to use that one. So I'm going to fire that one, get rid of that one. Now, that gives me getting toward the middle. So I'm going to take two photographs, one way back and one at, exact, at this exact point, which will give me time to go up to the tracks and catch the engine. So I took one picture, and then at the pre- I knew I was going to take it right by that pier. It measured, I knew exactly where I was going to fire the engine. All right? You have to pre, you have to know that. I didn't know, however, that the exhaust would go nicely over the mountain. So I fired the picture, threw my Rolleiflex over to my back, and climbed up and got ready to get on the engine. Well, I'd had a terrible accident on the Great Northern. You know, I was a young kid. I was from Yale. I was from the East Coast. And there was a rough and tumble brakeman who didn't really like me. And I was riding his train. It was a Friday afternoon. It was a local out in South Dakota. I think it was on the Watertown branch. And it was lots of snow. And he said, well, I said, the train's going too fast. I can't catch it. Well, he said, you better, because there's no train by until Monday. And this was the dead of winter <laughs> in the middle of South Dakota. So he said, I'll catch the front end, which is the dangerous end. You catch the rear end. So I did. And it pulled my arm out of joint. Luckily, I, I knew how to hold on with the other arm. 
and I put my foot up into the set box just the way I was supposed to, grab and let the caboose is curved, guard whatever you call it, thin of the rail, pull me up. But in pulling it up, it pulled my arm out of joint. So here I am out here. With, I'm going to have to catch the ends of my right arm with my bad arm. So I said to myself, Pardon, stop thinking about it, concentrate on the picture, and concentrate on where you're going to put your foot when this engine comes by. And so we did, it came churning by, very, you know, going full out. And I did indeed grab the grab iron. My arm did not come out of joint, grabbed this side, did everything right, climbed up into the cab. And Doug Blue said, Did you get your picture? And I said, I did. That was it. And that was really the last run of the scoop. Not quite the last run of the steam engine, but almost. This is the Scioteville Bridge, which is in Ohio across the Ohio River. And it is a monumental bridge. It is a continuous truss, and it is the largest steel continuous truss bridge in the world. It also has the heaviest dead and live load of any bridge in the world. It was built by, designed by a man named Gustav Lindenthal. Finished in 1917, the same year that Lindenthal completed his best known masterpiece, the Hellgate Bridge in New York. He also managed to have time to build another continuous truss bridge across the Kentucky River, which also opened in 1917. Busy man, vintage year for bridges. This, I'm sure you probably know, is the Kinsua Viaduct in Pennsylvania. This is the second bridge on the site, which built in the early night part of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century. 302 feet high. It was the second highest bridge in the world it was used by the Erie Railroad until 1959, when it was abandoned. And the Erie sold it to a scrap dealer known as Mr. Nick Kovalachek, right? Who took one look at the bridge and said it was too beautiful to tear down. So he refused to tear it down. He's also the man who saved the East Broadtop Railroad in Pennsylvania. And he sold it to the state of Pennsylvania that used it as a park for people to walk around and walk across it. And then a little railroad started up a steam operation and they ran it across the bridge for a while until it was determined that the bridge really was too weak to sustain railroad traffic. So they still kept it open for a while so that you could walk across it. Finally, they closed it. And I may not have my date right, but there was a tornado that came through there, and I believe it was on July 13th, 2000, maybe you know, two, three, and it took down most of the bridge. So one of the great engineering masterpieces lies in ruins in the wilderness of Pennsylvania, and I very much doubt if they'll ever restore it. You know, the railroad, this just was a picture of a bridge. But what fascinated me was these people walking along the tracks. And there were three pigeons on top of the bridge. All right? Now these people were sort of struggling along. They'd stop and they'd get closer together. And I was waiting for them to be in exactly that position. All right? But I was also hoping that the pigeons would stop flapping around. So it just so happened that the pigeons calmed down and they were in exactly the right position for just that moment and I was able to take the picture. Without those people, this would be a very dull photograph, I think. Now, this is the condition of some of the railroad yards in Chicago just before the Penn Central took over. Very sad. This, however, is one of the most remarkable places i would never seen so many semaphore signals in my life. These were the throat tracks of the Central Railroad Company of New Jersey's Communipore Terminal in Jersey City, where all the passenger trains came to the great station and then they went by ferry to New York. This is gone. There is not one stick left of this place. No idea it existed. 
The station exists as a museum, all right? Ferries are gone. Not one thing remains in this place. It's extraordinary. It's such, a, such an amount of steel and such a very wonderfully business-like place, working place, should suddenly be obliterated. Now, this is another thing. I have spent a long time photographing the Great Lakes. I did a book on the Great Lakes steamers. And one of the things that the railroads do, of course, is unload carloads, in this case, coal, the Toledo. And look at these gigantic equipment, the stuff that they built. They run the coal, they run the copper cars up into this thing, and then they turn them over, upside down, dump the coal into the holes of the ship, right the car, and the car is then, is a little dolly, then is pushed out the other end, and it goes down a steep grade, and up a sort of a roller coaster, the top. They throw a switch, and it comes right down into the yard. And this goes on night and day. It's absolutely fascinating to watch. This is the high line of a steel mill, and I spent a year in this steel mill photographing everything that went on. But one of the things I think is so important is that, you know, Without the railroads, there wouldn't have been a steel industry. And of course, you can say without the steel industry, there wouldn't have been a railroad. So they really are locked together. This is a steel mill in Gary, Indiana, a coke plant. This is another steel mill in East Chicago. This is all taconite, all taconite, all ore. This is a taconite mine up in the Mesabi Range. Taconite, as you know, is, is, the, is a refined iron ore. Taconor, taconite is about 20% iron ore. And until recently, it was not economical to get the iron out of ore, which was only 20% out of a rock, which is only 20% iron. The, the iron that they were getting out of the Mesabi range was hematite, which was anywhere up to 60% ore. And so it was much easier just to dig it up, but they used it all up. Most of it was gone. They used it all up in the Second World War. And we had the Mesabi range up there, all of these iron towns, all these mining towns, until it was discovered how you could indeed get that 20% ore out Taconite was useless. It's all that's left up there today. It's only taconite, and they're running to run out of it. Taconite is 65% ore, and it comes in a little pellet about that big. Of course, the iron, the steel makers love it because it's consistent. This is in a steel mill, ingot moles. Great track. Now, this is on the Sydney and Lewisburg Railroad. This is North Sydney, or no, I'm sorry, it's is Sydney, Nova Scotia. The Sydney and Lewisburg Railroad, when I visited it in 1959, was a sort of an old folks home for American locomotives. Every locomotive they owned, except for three, had been bought secondhand or thirdhand from American railroads. And the, it was owned by the steel company, which is in the background, Dosco. Absolutely everything in that picture is gone. Not one thing remains today. But I had fun on the city of Lewisburg finding places like this, which don't exist anymore. This is the town of Thurmond, West Virginia, which I'm sure you may well know. This was a the largest coal loading port spot, let's say, on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad for years. It was also a place where they took coal and water and serviced the engines. The main street of Thurmond is right there, those buildings. There are two banks, a restaurant, several hotels, and stores. And the main street was the pavement, the platform, if you will, between the tracks and the buildings. 
The only road that came in there, which came in much later, was built on, the, on a branch line bridge over the New River so that they could actually have access to cars. There was a station behind me. This whole place was virtually abandoned and finally was bought by the National Park Service and it is now on the National Register of Historic Places because it is absolutely unique. There are very few places that I know of, maybe you do, where the railroad, Main Street, was the railroad tracks and the whole building, the main street of the town, was right on the railroad and no place else. It exists today, but it's not like the way it was when I photographed it. This is another place that isn't here. This is F.A. Tower in on Oneonta, New York, on the Delaware and Hudson. I worked when I was in college pounding spikes on an extra gang one summer out of Oneonta. And when I, the Smithsonian, the Department of Transportation, wanted to do a story on railroad men, they, I asked them where I, should, where I would like to go. I said, send me to the Delaware and Hudson because it's one of the most traditional railroads left in the country. Well, I did. I was in 1975. There is not one single thing left that's photographed here. Everything is gone. This great, enormous yard which was there, an enormous locomotive shops, roundhouse, everything. Great railroad town, Division Point, gone. I'm sure this is gone. This is a station in Nevada. I never know how to pronounce it. Between the Southern Pacific and the Western Pacific tracks, that part of Nevada, where they ran jointly. This is a place called Martin, North Dakota. You know, the year I was born in 1932, 94% of all the communities in the United States was served by a railroad. That's staggering to think of. Almost every town in America had a depot. How many towns have depots today? Not very many. This station was a telegraph station. The Sioux Line, which it still is, it was Canadian Pacific, is blind. There are no signals. Everything runs by train order. Now not by train order, but now by dispatcher and by radio. When I was there, it was all train orders. And that Martin, even though there were no passenger trains, it was used as a train order station. Empty platforms. But here was a traditional railroad scene. Here is the, actually the station agent himself on a rainy day at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, about to hand up some kind of an order or message to a Baltimore and Ohio train. You can see that on the waiting over here on the side is a hope for the, for the caboose, for the conductors. Now this is the cover of the book. And this, to me, is one of my very favorite photographs. This photograph was made because I have to tell you, I was at Yale and I had a date at Smith College which didn't go very well. So I thought to myself, well, the central Vermont's only 10 miles away in Amherst, so I'm going to go over to Amherst because I know the central Vermont 491 the manifest plate, the one coming toward you, will be along shortly. So I did. I went over to the station. The local was in the hole waiting for it. And so I asked him, I said, how soon? He said, well, it should be along 15, 20 minutes. Good timing. But he didn't tell me it was double-headed. So I set up to take it right here. And of course, I, as I heard it coming, I heard two engines. And you can see the exhaust from the other engine. And, and, they must be blowing the boiler down at this point because here's this great kind of steam. But anyway, this is the kind of thing that I remember all as a child, as a young man. I was, this was taken in 1954, I was 22. And this is the kind of thing I grew up with. And so I thought this was an appropriate picture to use on the cover. Now, this is made, this negative was unprintable, completely unprintable, so this is scanned and you, I made from a digital, absolutely, this is digital. The whole thing was computer, com, 
reconstructed, restored through Photoshop. The fire on the Virginia Blue Ridge. So on the Canadian Pacific, that's the 136, it's one of four American Standard 44 Orcs locomotives that they used on this little piece of railroad that ran from Norton to Chipman, New Brunswick. And the reason that they had them there was because there was a bridge at a place called Wash de Moke, a wonderful name, that was too feeble to carry anything else except these three little engines. <laughs> So the CPR kept them running, hoping to be able to find an engine to, re to rebuild the bridge or find an engine, a diesel, that was light enough to go over the bridge. But the traffic dwindled to such a degree <laughs> that they never bothered to salvage the line or the bridge. They abandoned it. And these three engines were saved. And one of them is in front of the Canadian Pacific's office in Calgary. And I had the number plate from that engine, and I returned it a few years ago to the Canadian Pacific. So hopefully they put it back on the engine where it belongs. Sydney and Lewisburg, this was on the branch of the Sydney and Lewisburg, a local train that went back and went out one way and came back. This was, you know, no turn, no why, nothing. And the, and the railroad, with, you know, flowers growing up through the tracks. It was just extraordinary. This was again on the city of Lewisburg. This looks like, now I said the other night, I said this was to be taken in the last century. I mean the 19th century. Brakeman riding the pilot beam. This is the Chama, New Mexico. The picture of them sanding the engine was the same, this engine also, untouched. This is the Mount Washington Cog Railway, which until very recently had steam engines like this hauling the trains up the mountain on a cog railway with a 68% grade. You can see where the boiler is tilted so that it was level the whole time. Well, recently they decided that these steam engines were really polluting the atmosphere of the White Mountains. And so they, they decided that they should use biodiesels. So they contacted John Deere company. And in cooperation with the machine shop in New Hampshire, they, in 2008, put the first of their biodiesels in service, and they have ordered three more. And they're still running. They run as many as 10 trains a day up and down the mountainside with little passing tracks along the way. I've never taken them. I'm terrified to take it because they've had some pretty bad accidents. But anyway, fireman watering. This engine that lives in this barn is the 5244, which was the last surviving Pennsylvania Railroad steam engine. Now, you know the Pennsylvania Railroad had a massive roster of huge locomotives, famous for its great big wonderful locomotives, synonymous with the steam engine. Well, it came boiled down to one engine, which was leased by the Union Transportation Company in New Jersey to run once a day, up the line and back, for heaven knows what, I never saw them carry very much. But this is coming out of the engine house. And the engine house, when they shut it up at night, they shut the barn doors and they put two big posts against it and they put a little latch and the engine spent the night in the barn. And this was the right of way. And this train went up, usually picked up a car or something, and went back. They never turned it around, there was no place to turn it. This was made in June of 1959. On June the 14th of 1959, July 14th, 1959, they retired the engine, took it over to Philadelphia, dropped the fires, and that was the end of the Pennsylvania Railroad steam engines. Now, this is, I'm sure you know, is the Denver Rio Grande Western, where it was the Denver Rio Grande Western. And I and my first wife went to Durango to photograph. Well, we waited for a week while they gathered enough cars to get a train on the road. So, after a week, 
train starts out, and we go out, wait to photograph it. Wait, 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 wait. Nothing happens. So we drive back toward Durango, and there, off in the sagebrush, we see smoke from two engines, just sort of drifting lazily over the fields. So I walked out. I said, what happened? Firebox door broke. We called, we called, waiting for a blacksmith. So they waited for a blacksmith. Meanwhile, 16 hour law came up with them. So that train crew had to go back. They had to get a taxi to come and pick them up and take them back to Durango and bring another one out. The next day, the train spent the night in the, in the sagebrush. The next day, went to Chama, New Mexico, where they spent the night. The next morning, they took half the train, engine in front, engine in back, up to Cumbridge Pass, which is 10,000 feet. Then they turn the engines around, and here they are going up. This is a 4% grade. Well, you wouldn't know that there was a railroad there unless you saw a train. <laughs> Absolutely not. This is the same train. And they took all day, half a day, three quarters of a day, whatever it is, to get it up. It was nightfall. We started out at six in the morning. At nightfall, they finally put the train together and went on the way to Antonito at the end of the narrow gauge. This is a three foot gauge, narrow gauge. And in that first picture, you could see that the engines are outside frame, the wheels are inside the rods. Everything's on the outside. They were standard gauge engines that were rebuilt into narrow gauge engines. There are 22 of them left, and they're either in service or preserved or used to cannibalize for parts. But this is on today the Cumbridge and Toltec Railroad. The other part of the railroad is now the Durango and Silverton, which is a very successful tourist line. Cumbridge and Toltec has had a disaster this year. The Great Viaduct, the Lobato Viaduct, burned, as you probably know. And they're worried about being able to rebuild it. Meanwhile, they have trucked the engines over the other side of Cumbridge Pass and are running trains between Antonino and Cumbridge without going over the hill. It's not the same, but at least the railroad is there. This is on the Milwaukee. At Bozeman, Montana, there's not one stick left of this, taken in 1954. This is just a typical scene, it used to be. This is at Harvey, New Brunswick, under CPR. This is the Canaan Union Station in North Canaan, Connecticut, built in 1872. Magnificent building, built actually by a man who was an undertaker. The best man they could find to build it was used to building coffins. So they hired him to build this station. Now this station stayed in service until they finally closed down the railroad service. And it was bought by some people and used in one thought or another. And then on one night in 2003, I believe, four young teenagers decided it would be a great lark to burn the station down, which they did. They're in the process of trying to restore it, but the real station is no longer there, which is a terrible shame. This is just a very simple place, crossing of two railroads, the Toledo Pier and Western and a branch of the IC at El Paso, Illinois. This is a station in Delaware, Ohio, Chesapeake and Ohio. Again, the station, such an important thing. South Plainfield, New Jersey, on the Lehigh Valley. This is Rochester Junction, New York, on the Lehigh Valley. How many station windows that you look into today do you see all that equipment? Not too many, if any. Or inside. This is the Baltimore and Ohio station yard office in East Salamanca, New York, in 1975, is all gone today. And so is this scene. The ticket office, or whatever you want to call it, the station master's office in Thompson, Pennsylvania, it's now an ice cream parlor. Mr. Burkhead, Frederick, Oklahoma, 
MKT station agent. I was there photographing one day and I stayed very late in the day. It was after five o'clock and Mr. Burkhead was still there. And I asked him, I said, am I bothering you? I, I, you know, I, don't you want to go home? So, you know, time to quit. No. He said, no. And he kept sort of moving things around and putting them in order. Finally, he said to me, I'm retiring today after 60 years on the railroad. Now, I'm the only person there. Nobody from the town, nobody from the railroad, nobody from his family. Just an itinerant photographer. So I said to him, you know, I think this occasion should be commemorated. Would you sit for me? May I take your portrait? And so he sat, and I did. And after I'd finished, he put his coat on, and he had a keychain, and we walked out the door. Meanwhile, he'd given me his card and his address. We walked out the door, he took the keychain off, the key off his keychain, locked the door, dropped it in the mailbox, and said, for the new man, Monday morning. We shook hands, and he got in his car, and I got in my car. This was taken in July of 1968. I didn't get back home until November. I was on the, in the field until November. I didn't get around to, I took hundreds and hundreds of rolls of film. I didn't get around to developing the film, much less making prints, until sometime in the spring. So I sent him a photograph to the address he'd given me, and shortly thereafter, it was returned addressy unknown. I did subsequently find out that he did indeed move to Tallahassee, which was not the address he'd given me, and that he died in 1971. But I will always feel very badly that he never got to see the picture that I took of him on the day of his retirement. Anyway, this is in the Reading Outer Station, filled with wonderful little corners and wonderful little vignettes. This is inside the Canaan station that burned down. Hadn't been touched since the day it was built. This is in the station. This is one, this is the waiting room. This is the ticket office, same station. Chicago and Eastern Illinois station in Princeton, Indiana. Happily, it's now a library. It's been saved. Train stopped running, so it's stopping there, 1970 something. But how many places have you brought these signs up? Bowman Company's gone, you know? All of these different things that were part of the interior of a railroad station, you don't find these today. This is the Reading Outer Station again. An incredible building. Untouched. This is the concourse that led to the ticket office. This is the Central Vermont station in St. Albans, Vermont. A wonderful brick building where the trains ran through portals into the station, through the brick. And the roof was held up by a Howe truss. This was taken in June of 1963. In September, they tore it down. This is the westbound Phoebe Snow in Scranton, Pennsylvania in January 1964. I was doing a story for Horizon Magazine on railroad stations, and I went to Scranton. I went all up and down, all over the eastern part of the country, photographing railroad stations while there were still stations. And I saw this train, and so I had a Rolleiflex around my neck and a great big heavy winter coat, but I thought, I should ask the station master before going out and taking a picture of the train, just to be polite. And just told him I was there. So I went to the ticket window and he said, oh, no, 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 I can't give you permission. I have to call the superintendent. So I thought, well, forget it. That's not going to happen. You're not going to get permission. So I just went out and I threw myself down on a baggage truck, put the Rotoflex up in front of me, and I waited until the people were in just the right position, taking several photographs. And this was the one I chose. 
Now, how many places like this exist today? Not too many. We don't heat trains with steam anymore. But how many people have photographed and painted railroad stations? I mean, Monet has painted them. Alfred Hitchcock made many a film. There's something about the railroad station with the steam coming up out of the cars that spoke of the mystery and the wonder of departure and of travel. This doesn't exist anymore. This station is now the Scranton Radisson Hotel. And this place, this wonderful bush train shed, is now, I guess you'd call it a tea room. The Phoebe Snow made its last run in November 1966, and I was on it. John Caffrey, conductor, Lehigh Valley Railroad, number 25 and 26, the Asa Packer. I knew this man from the time I was a very young boy. And I got to know him because one day I took the train out of Penn Station, Lehigh Valley went into Pennsylvania Station in New York, and they changed at Hillside Junction to a Lehigh Valley engine. Came out of New York behind a GG1 in Pennsylvania, changed to a Lehigh Valley engine at Hillside Junction. And at Hillside Junction that morning, they had a steam engine come on, and it was supposed to be a diesel. So when Mr. Caffrey came through, and I asked him, I said, why do you have a diesel? Well, he said, it's a weekend. They use, we don't have enough diesels to go around, so we put a steam engine on, on Saturdays. So he said, we got to talking, he said, come with me. So we went up to the baggage car, which is right next to the coach. I always sat in the front coach so I could hear the engine better. And he told the baggage master, he said, listen, let this kid sit here. You pull up a trunk, put some chains in front of it, open the door, put some chains in front of it, put a trunk there, and let him sit all the way to Pittston, because it was supposed to go to Wilkes-Barre, but the train went all the way to Pittston Junction. And he said, stay with me, and we'll get off. And he said, I'll put you on the, the other train, the eastbound train. So this became sort of a tradition and of course, eventually the diesels took over altogether, but I still rode because I was such good friends with Mr. Caffrey. He was so terribly nice to me. Just as Bill Cannon and Bill, what was his name, on the, on the Rutland, my memory begins to go. But all of these men were so absolutely, Bill Hogan, absolutely marvelous. Curly Burns on the central Vermont. All these men took such an interest in a young boy, and they all became I never knew my grandfathers, and these men all were really surrogate grandfathers, and they were absolutely marvelous. And now, of course, and that was one hell of a thrill, I'll tell you. Anyway, this was the departure. This was the last place where we had several steam engines leaving at the same time. This was at Winter Station. This it's not in which station, but the whole idea of being up there when those drivers started to turn and the steam was moving out of the pistons, out of the cocks, cylinder cocks, and you could sense this magnificent engine moving. And here it was in Vaudreuil on one of the very last days it ran. It was about 10 below zero, maybe more, and this engine started up out of the station on a commuter train. You don't see this commuter train. This could be any station, any engine starting out of any station in those wonderful days. So could this be any train running across the landscape. And this is the way I like to remember these things. I remember the railroad as a st with these steam engines. I remember them. I stroke my eyes and I can hear them. I can see them. Now, however, there is one thing as an epitaph. This is the Canadian Pacific 2816. I photographed it when it was dead in Montreal with a sign on it saying boiler empty to tell the hostler, for God's sake, don't try to fire it up because there's no water in it. Well, as I was saying, the Canadian Pacific had a plethora of engines which they could use at any time. When the engines ran out of their time, the old engines were running out of their time, 
and they were taken out of service, they always had another one to put back in. Well, they did put this back in service when I was in Montreal. I didn't photograph it, but I photographed it here. Well, it made its last run on May 26, 1960. That is a verified fact. In June of 1960, the Canadian Pacific stopped using steam engines altogether, except to heat cars and to heat the roundhouse. But the end of the era of the steam engine for me came in 1960 on the scoot. But it also came the end in Montreal. But you probably know about Nelson Blount, who started Steamtown in Vermont who was a collector of locomotives. He built boats, he sold clams to, clam to Campbell's, and he made millions. And he spent his millions buying up locomotives. And he bought locomotives from as large as Union Pacific Big Boy to tiny little two-foot gauge engines that used to run around the cranberry bogs. He made run around cranberry bogs in Massachusetts, two-foot gauge engines from Maine. He bought all kinds of locomotives. And he bought the 2816. And he had it, and he kept it. And Nelson loved to fly his own plane. And he was killed one afternoon in flying, trying to land his plane at Steamtown in Bellows Falls. And Steamtown fell on hard times without Nelson. And finally, the National Park Service decided, well, I didn't want it anyway. So they finally decided to move it to some place that there might be more people. So very, in some very political thing, which I don't know about, and that finally the government ended up making a national park of Steamtown. And the entire collection was moved out there. And they still run some trains out there, but the majority of their collection sits and rusts. The Canadian Pacific like the Union Pacific, as you know, the Union Pacific has two wonderful roving ambassadors, the Challenger and the old 844, which has never retired from service. So the Canadian Pacific thought perhaps they should have one too. So they bought the 2816 from Steamtown. And they took it to North Vancouver, where the British Columbia Railroad, now part of the Canadian National, actually ran the last of active Royal Hudson's. And they spent $2 million to refurbish the engine. They made it an oil burner so that it would be more economical. But aside from that, it is the most beautifully reconstructed engine. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it is still running. In fact, it ran just a few weeks ago. So it's a sort of a happy ending to this talk that we have one of these wonderful engines that is still operating. And if it weren't for organizations like some of the members here belong to, if it weren't for people like the Canadian Pacific, if it weren't for people who like the Sandbergs who own the 261, we wouldn't have steam engines today. But thank heaven, we still do, even though they're not in everyday service. Anyway, thank you for coming. Anybody wants to ask any questions, I'd be happy to. No, I have been a black and white photographer for years. I have, I have used color, but when I went to, to teach for the first time at the Institute of Design in Chicago in 1978, I suddenly realized that my students really understood color, and one of the teachers there had been the assistant to Elliot Porter, one of the great color photographers of the world, and I realized I knew nothing about color. You know, I don't understand the color of light, which is crucial if you're going to photograph color. I don't understand the architecture of color. In point of fact, I'm colorblind when I'm taking a photograph. It doesn't matter. I don't know the color of anything. I can't tell you the color of anything that I photographed. But I'm not colorblind. I'm going to realize that this room is not black and white. <laughs>
when I'm photographing, it's all black and white. And it has been for years. And I, I'm very comfortable with black and white because of the, of the light and the shadow and the form and the kind of photographs that I make, the sort of sculptural locomotives or whatever, I think the color might detract, at least to me. Black and white is more abstract. And I think for me, I don't, as I said, I don't see in color. I see the shape, I see the form, I see the light, but I don't see things in color. Shades of gray. True, true. Thank you so much, really. I'm very trusted. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. This I will cherish. <laughs>